Amen. Hey, I am I'm so excited about the direction that God is taking us this year for sisterhood. We're gonna learn how to count it all joy, leaving behind all the stuff of 2020, right? Breaking through into the joy of 2021. But you know what? I don't I don't think it's as easy as just like poof, right? I'm full of joy now. I think that we have to kind of dig in and do some hard work of making room in our lives for those components of joy, for Jesus, for others, and for yourself. And so tonight, before we take an extended time to worship Jesus together in this room, I wanna talk to you really quick about just that, about how we can make room in our lives for Jesus. So before we start tonight, I wanna pray for us. And I'd love for you to just stay standing in this moment just so we're not distracted by anything else. But I wanna tell you really quick, I wanna remind you about the story, um, the parable that Jesus shared in Matthew 13 when he talked about the seed that fell on all the different types of soil. Do you remember that? All the different types of rocky soil and thorny soil. And uh, we are going to talk tonight from the seed. The seed is the word of God, and the seed is always good, right? The seed is always good. Now the condition of our hearts, the condition of our soil, not always, right? And so before we begin tonight, as I pray, I would love for you to take the time just to confess to God the condition of your soil. I can bring good seed, but I can't make the soil any good but God can. And so tonight as we start, I just want you to just, he already knows, right? But just tell him, tell him how you walked into this room tonight. You might have walked in and you were so tired and you were so discouraged and you have so much going on. I just want you to confess that, tell that to God tonight. You might have come with a friend, you've never been here before. She promised that you could go out over to the mall and eat dinner afterwards, and so you're like, okay. But you're kind of indifferent, right? You walked in here, you're not sure about this God thing anyways. I just want you to take a minute just to tell him that. You might have gone through something horrible this last year, or currently, your heart might be just so, so broken and sad tonight. So I just want you to confess that to God tonight as we pray. And so if you would, in just an act of openness to surrender, just, you can leave your hands low if you want to, but just turn them up. Just face your palms up. Just, just saying, God, tonight I'm open. I am open to hear from you. And let's pray together. God, tonight I'm just so thankful to be in this room, in this space with all of these beautiful women. God, you have created each and every one of them in your image, and they are are here tonight, each one of them for a specific reason, God, and you know what that specific reason is. And so tonight, God, as as we dig into the seed, into the Word of God, we know that the Bible tells us that, that your Word won't return void. And so we come before you tonight, and we just ask you to start just to till up, dig up that soil in our heart. God, make it ready. Make us ready. Make us open to hear from you tonight as we start to learn about what it looks like to choose joy and how to make room in our lives for you. God, I ask that you just speak to us tonight in a way that you never have before. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. I'm gonna probably need someone to bring out my podium. Oh, there it is. Look at that. This is my son. Isn't he cute? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> He's gonna kill me. <laughs> well, I am so excited. I'm so excited to be here in this room with you tonight. I'm excited about a lot of different things. I'm excited about our new merchandise. <laughs> what do you think? Isn't that cute? Hey, we've got two different styles of these. They're going to be for sale across the lobby. And fair warning, you guys showed up tonight. (laughs) So we have a limited supply of these sweatshirts. Please be kind to the women that are selling them. (laughs) 
no fights over the sweatshirts. If needed, you guys, we can always order more of these. I'm not sure that's the direction we're gonna go, so please don't hold me to that. But we do have a limited supply of these sweatshirts, but I'm so excited about these. Do you wanna know what else I'm excited about? My future, thank you. My future daughter-in-law is about to be born. <laughs> Kelsey over here, pregnant, due soon, any couple weeks, right? Couple weeks, four weeks. weeks. She is carrying my daughter-in-law. And <laughs> we've already decided that sh th this baby girl is gonna marry our four-year-old son. And so, Colby and I have asked them, the laws, to please make sure that her first name sounds good with Atkins because she's gonna be an Atkins longer than she'll ever be a law. So, so excited for our newest baby little sister to join our squad in a couple weeks. Yeah, woo! Growing a baby's hard work, it is. Hey, I'm excited to meet some of you guys tonight, some of you that I've never met before. I can stand up here and I can introduce myself and say, my name is Kristen, it's great to meet you. My husband Colby is the pastor here at this church. We are you know, in the middle of raising four amazing men of God, all the way from our four-year-old, who's almost married, our four-year-old <laughs> up to this 15-year-old. Um, and I have another son on that camera over there. Everybody say, hey, Jake. Hey. <laughs> now they'll both hate me. Um, but I could stand up here and say that, but I would really just, I would love the chance to actually get to meet you and to learn your name too. So if at the after party, if you can find me out there, I would love that chance to get to say, hey, to meet you. Um, but tonight we are going to just dig into our story for the night. It's found in 2 Kings chapter four. So if you have your Bible and you want to flip to that, we'll also have the scripture on the screen. But we're gonna start in verse eight. And so tonight is, the, is our very first step in our joy journey this year. It's our first step and we're gonna focus on Jesus tonight and how if we wanna have true and lasting joy in our life, that we have to learn how to make room for Jesus first. So really quick, just like what does that look like in 2021, what does it look like to take our lives and to make room for Jesus? In a time in history where women, uh, we've never been more busy, right? Never been more busy, never had so many demands and distractions placed on us at the same time. I feel like women throughout history have had demands on them, right? But we've got all these distractions coupled with those demands. We've got expectations. We've got, you know, you need to kill it at work and you need to climb that corporate ladder and you need to go after that promotion and you need to take on that new client and you need to take that extra job. But at the same time, you need to be totally present at home and you need to close that laptop and you need to ignore that email and let that go to voicemail. We have to, on one hand, we have to create these beautiful, organic, home cooked from scratch meals, right? For our kids that taste like pancakes, but they're actually roots, like right? disgusting. We have to do that at the same time. We gotta stick to this little budget over here, buy all this organic food, but on this budget, and you also have to do it in between soccer practice and band rehearsal and picking up the preschool, like preschool or karate, right? We've got so much stuff going on in our lives. How can we make room in the middle of that? How do we make room for Jesus? And I, I'm sure if I could look into every single one of your hearts, I'm sure that you desperately want that in your life. But it's kind of like a six pack, right? It's kind of like abs, like we all want that, right? It's almost summer, we all want it. But getting that, attaining that, that can be really hard work. Our story tonight in 2 Kings, it's gonna introduce us to a woman. And if you have headings in your Bible over sections of scripture, you might see the word Shunammite woman inside of that heading. And so before we even like get into the story, we already know something about this woman. We already know that she goes unnamed. She's not given a name. A name is not recorded for her 
in scripture, and it's not because she wasn't important. The Bible tells us, you're gonna see the Bible tells us she was an important woman. She was a wealthy woman. She was a well-to-do woman, but she goes unnamed. And I kind of love that because I feel like already, before we even read anything about her, we already have one connection point with her because there's probably been times in your life where you felt like nobody knows my name. I don't, maybe tonight, maybe you're here for the very first time. I'm so thankful that you're here, but maybe you're sitting in your seat and you're like, nobody knows my name. They don't know anything about me. Perhaps it's not in this scenario, but maybe there's another situation in your life where you feel unnamed, that nobody knows anything about you. And we can connect with this woman based on that. And here's what I want to tell you tonight, that no one might know your name tonight, but guess what? God uh, knows your name. He created you. He knows your name. He knows what brought you in here tonight. Aren't we thankful that we serve a God that cares about us like that? Well, let's jump in and we're going to just read through her entire story and then we're going to look back at different parts of it. So we're going to start in verse 8 and read together. It says, one day Elisha went to Shunem and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. And so whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, she said, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof. I need you to remember that part, on the roof. Put it in a, and put in it a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp for him, and then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. Verse 11, one day when Elisha came, he went up to his room. So obviously he started to come to her house, right? Because he's already calling it his room. He went up to his room and he lay down there. He said to his servant Gehazi, call the Shunammite. And so he called her and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, tell her, You've gone to all of this trouble. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? So basically he's saying, you've built me this room. Like, thank you so much. Now what can I do for you? How can I pay you back? What can I do? And she replied, I have a home among my people. Basically meaning I'm good. Like, thank you, but I'm good. I don't need anything. I'm good. Verse 14. What can be done for her, Elisha asked. Gehazi said, well, she has no son and her husband is old. Then Elisha said, call her. And so he called her and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, this is verse 16, about this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she objected, please, Man of God, don't mislead your servant. Verse 17, but the woman became pregnant and the next year, about that same time, she gave birth to a son just as Elisha had told her. So in this passage of scripture, we're introduced to this woman who makes an occasional meal for the prophet Elisha. Now, a prophet was simply just someone who was chosen by God to speak to the people. So God would give the prophet the message and the prophet would tell that message to the people. And this this woman knows that this prophet of God kept coming through her town. He would come to town and he would speak to groups of people. He would speak on behalf of God. He would teach them. He would preach to them. He would prophesy into their lives. And she began to have this thought. She thought, you know what? Like we've had this guy over for dinner a couple times now, and he must like my cooking, right? Because he keeps coming back. But I wonder, I wonder if maybe next time, I wonder if he would actually not just have dinner with us, but stay with us. I wonder if when he's in town speaking to the masses on behalf of God, I wonder if he would come to my, my house and he would stay in my home. And he, here's what I think that she knew, which so many of us women know, right? That a lot of really great conversations happen 
at home. They happen when you are seated, seated down at your, your dining room table and the conversation just keeps flowing. It, great conversations happen at your couch and your living room with your friends or your family. What about around a bonfire on a summer's night out at your house or maybe a winter's night in your hot tub underneath the stars? Like great conversations happen in our house. You might have a teenager and it might be like 11.30 at night and she finally wants to open up and talk, right? And all you wanna do is just go to bed because you're exhausted, but oh my gosh, like you would not miss that conversation for anything. Great conversations happen at our house. I think that this woman in our story, I think that she had this thought, okay, well maybe, maybe after Elisha is done in town and he is done speaking to the people on behalf of God, maybe, just maybe, he'd come back to my house and then, then I can make him some of my world famous dessert one night and maybe we could be sitting around the kitchen table or maybe early in the morning as my husband and I are getting coffee, maybe he would sit with us too. And you guys, maybe, maybe just like something extra would just slip out of his mouth. Maybe we'd be able to have a conversation where he would be able to speak to not just the masses, but maybe he'd be able to speak to me. Maybe I would get to learn something more. I think that this woman had a deep desire in her to learn more, to hear more from God. And she was hoping that by having the man of God in her house, that she would be able to do just that. And so, so what did she do? She said to her husband, right? She said in verses nine and 10, she said to her husband, well, let's make a room. Like, here's the plan. Let's put up these walls and let's get a bed and it'll go here and we'll get a table for him and we'll get a little chair and we'll get a lamp. She so desperately wanted to hear the voice of God in her life that she literally, she came up with a plan and then she literally made room to hear from the man of God in order for us to be able to make room for God in our lives, we've gotta do the same thing. We have to have a plan. And so should we all go home and go up into our attics or our basements and get out a measuring tape and see if we have space to actually make a room? No, right, that would be crazy. But there are ways that we can plan to make room in our lives for God. One of those ways, you're doing it right now, right? You've set aside time on a Friday night to come into this building, to come into this room. You've set aside this time to grow in your relationship with Jesus. Things like sisterhood nights and Sunday, Saturday night worship time, those times and small groups and Bible studies, those are all great ways to make room for God, those corporate ways, large and small. But I don't know if you're like me. I feel like the times when God whispers or shouts to, to me the most are those times when it's just him and it's just me and I've made room in my life to spend time with him. Those, those special times, like I can't stand up here and tell you exactly how to plan for those times because each one of us, we're all created so differently. So there might be some of you in here that all you gotta do is put in your AirPods and you go for a run, like 10 miles, right? You've got your worship music going, you're praying, you feel so connected to others of you. You're like, that, just thinking about that exhausts me. Like I would never, <laughs> no, that one's not for me, right? Others of you, you might get up early in the morning and that just might be, you need to protect that time if that's you. If that's the time when you connect with Jesus that early morning before anybody is in your house is awake, that might be what works for you. For others, depending upon what season of life you're in, you might have little kids at home. You might have the teenagers that stay up late, and so you stay up late, so mornings are extra hard. You might have a job that, does, that makes it so that you can't have that type of schedule. That might not work for you. But something else might work. Some of you are, are artistic and creative and maybe when you're painting or creating something, that's when you experience the presence of God. Some of you might 
dig into scripture, right? Like you've got your Bible and you've got your concordance and you're gonna look up what every one of those words mean in the Greek, or maybe you just like to read books, you devour books, you want to learn more. Maybe podcasts are your thing. Listen, if something I said doesn't like ring a bell and you're like, yes, that's my thing, that's okay. That just means you haven't found your thing yet. And so this is what I heard somebody once recommend. Take a piece of paper, write down three, four, five ways where you think, you know what, if I had to sit down and plan to make room for God in my life, like these are a couple things that I would like to try. Write them down. So if number one on your list is to grab a journal, the one that you're gonna make, the journal, a pen, the, your Bible, and go down to Presque Isle and just sit by the water and read and journal and pray, then do it. Make a plan and go and do it. And while you're there, if you are just, you just feel so like connected and fulfilled and you come home and you're a different woman, then listen, you found your way, right? But if while you're there, you're like, what time is it? Are they picking him up at soccer? What about karate? What about dinner? If, what about that email? If that time away, time away stresses you out, then listen, that's just not for you. So just mark it off, right? Go down to number two. But the thing is, you just have to find a plan that works for you. So in my season of my life, like it would be really, really hard for me to carve out time or just me alone that I could spend with God. And so in January, being totally honest with you, like I just kind of really just got fed up about this, about me, that I could not keep a consistent time with Jesus in my life. And I knew that if, if mom Kristen and if wife Kristen, if Kristen's gonna be you know, the best she can be, I've got to be connected to the source. And so I was like, you know what? I've gotta do what I gotta do to find a plan. So this is what I did. Now, I don't recommend this for everybody because like I said, we're all different, but this is what worked for me. I just said, okay. We're coming off of this crazy year. I've watched so much news and <laughs> watched everything that's going on in the media. I've concentrated so much on that noise that's in my life, in addition to social media. So media, social media, all that stuff. I just said, you know what? It, none of it really matters. I'm gonna turn it off. And I turned off all of that stuff for the month of February. I always recommend doing things in February because it's the shortest month. So. <laughs> Turned it all off in February, and I said, I'm just gonna replace that time with time in the Word. Now, like I said, I, it's, it's hard for me to be alone ever in my house, and so I just said, I, I'm not gonna be able to dig down into this one verse and see how, what it means to me, but I am gonna just try to immerse myself in Scripture. I'm gonna take this time and change it and make it Bible time. So I just had my, my app on my phone with me all the time. So in between bath time and homework time and while I was driving to soccer to pick people up or work to pick people up, I would, I'd have the Bible man reading to me on the, the YouVersion app and my kids that whole month, whenever they would get close to the car, when I would pick them up, they'd be like, mom, turn down the Bible. It's in the car. <laughs> but you guys, I did it. I decided to read the entire Bible in 30 days and I did it. Like, I am so proud of that fact, but I'm also so ashamed of that fact because what does that mean about me? How much time was I wasting that I could just substitute that time with Jesus' time? And I went from Genesis to Revelation in a month. It was, it was crazy. But here's what happened. I just, I just came up with a plan that worked for me. And listen, that's what I'm asking you to do tonight. Just find a plan that works for you. And listen, a plan that works for you is a plan that you will do. A plan that works is simply just a plan that you'll do. We have to be intentional though, you guys. We have to, we're so busy, we're so distracted. We've gotta be intentional about making room in our lives for God. We have to plan for it. Looking back at this story, we're going to start back in, in verse 11, where we're going to learn a little bit more about this woman's life. We already knew that she was a wealthy, well-to-do, important woman. Then we found out that um, she was also good at renovation projects. 
But here we find out also that this woman was childless. And we don't really know much else about that fact. Like we don't know that maybe she was just never ever able to conceive month after month. She just found herself not pregnant again. We don't know, maybe she faced um, miscarriage. Maybe she was able to get pregnant really easily, but she faced miscarriage after miscarriage. All we really know is what the Bible tells us, and that's that she didn't have any children. I could guess, though, by the way that, that it was brought up. Like, she is not the one that brought this up in the scripture. I can guess by the fact that she didn't bring it up that it was probably really painful for her, that she had probably spent years praying and crying and praying and crying and praying and crying about this until she ended up just, the Bible tells us, right, that her husband was old. And so she probably ended up just taking that dream of having a child one day and just putting it in a box and closing the lid and just hiding that away in her heart. And even though we don't have the details in the story, we know that it's probably true based upon what she says in verse 16. Verse 16, she says, no, my Lord, please don't mislead your servant. Another version of this verse says, don't deceive me. Don't get my hopes up like that. It's as if she was saying anything but that, God. Anything but that. That's something that I have wanted for so long. That's something that, that my heart has ached for until it just completely broke into a million pieces and I had to just, just put it in the box, right? I had to close the lid. I had to, to hide it away in my heart. I had to, to shove it underneath my bed. What about you tonight? Do you have some hopes or some dreams and some desires? Maybe you have the hope of reconnecting with someone in your life. Maybe a mom or a dad or a, a sibling, maybe a friend. You have that hope of that reconnection. Maybe you've always wanted to start a business and you had this dream forever and you never had the funds to start the business. Maybe you have the, the desire to, to get healthy once and for all. I'm gonna do it. Maybe, maybe you've had a dream for as long as you can remember about meeting an amazing man of God. Or maybe you have that desire for, for your husband to start living a sold out life for Jesus and start spiritually leading in your family. Maybe you have a, a hope for a, a rebellious to return home and to return to the Jesus that, that he grew up or she grew up learning about because you were teaching him. Maybe you have a, the desire for an illness to be healed for, for, for some sickness in your body to be cured or maybe for, for the bottle to stop calling your name or maybe to be able to stay pure until you're married. Listen, I don't know what dream or hope or desire that's just too tender to talk about, to even think about tonight. I don't know what's in your box. It might be the same as the woman in our story. You might have the desire to become a mother you might have the desire to, to have another child. And I just want you to know tonight that that dream, that hope, that desire, I can completely relate to. Like I have walked through that. I have walked through years of infertility. I've walked through the heartbreak of miscarriage. I wanna show you a picture tonight. This is a picture that I've kept in my journal for the past 18 years. And I keep this picture, I think I have it on the screen. Yeah, I keep this picture in my journal just as a reminder of God's faithfulness in my life. This picture was snapped by my sister um, one summer, one month, one morning after I found out that, you know, yet again another roller coaster of emotions month had gone by where I had You've been excited and anticipated, maybe hopefully this time being pregnant, to again, just finding out that once again, you know, the test was negative. And for some reason, I was always drawn 
down to the water as I would grieve. And I wouldn't be surprised, as I was thinking about this story, I wouldn't be surprised if the woman in our story was, maybe she was drawn up to the roof as she would grieve. Because I know for me that when I would go down to the water and I would just see how, just how big and just how powerful that water is, it would remind me how big and how powerful God was in my life. And so maybe just, maybe she did the same thing. Maybe she went up to her roof and just staring at the, the vastness of the night sky, maybe that reminded her too about how God, how big and how powerful God was in her life too. The Bible tells us that she built this room. Did you catch that when I read it in the beginning? It says that she built this room on the roof. So maybe, this is just Kristen injecting here, but maybe, just maybe, she built this room on top of the very place that she used to go and cry out to God, pouring her heart out to God. So what, what is it for you tonight? What is it in your life? What have you been pouring out your heart to God about? Whatever that thing is that's in your life, here's what I believe that God is asking us to do tonight. Here's what I believe that next step is for us. Look at verse 15. It says, then Elisha said, call her. And so he called her and she stood in the doorway. And as she stood in the doorway, he delivered the miracle on behalf of God. Verse 16, it says, about this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. We have to position, we have to position ourselves to hear from God. The woman stood in the doorway. She positioned herself where she could hear from this man of God. She stood in that doorway. But listen, had she been too busy? What if she was over here doing the laundry or she was, she was doing something to make bread back in the day? What if she was so busy with whatever was that was important? An important thing, right? What if she was too busy doing the important thing to position herself, to stand in that doorway and to hear from God. So what doorway do we need to crawl back in tonight? What doorway do you need to position yourself back in? And listen, I get it. You might have to crawl to that doorway. You, you might be the place where you're just gonna roll off of that tear-stained bed and you're gonna pull yourself up into that doorway, but I believe tonight that there is a doorway that God himself is calling you to get back in. Hey, in everything in your life, everything might be pointing to death. Death of that relationship, death of that dream, death of that desire, but I need you to know tonight that we serve a life-giving God. He breathes life back into dry bones. He does the miracle. He parts the Red Sea. He heals when we just reach out and touch the hem of his garment. But you guys, even that woman was positioned close enough to be able to reach out and to receive that healing. What doorway, what doorway do you need to get back in? Get back in and position yourself to receive the power of God. We position ourselves to receive the power of God. If we don't make room for God in our life, the world is gonna consume. If we don't intentionally make room in our lives, the world will consume us. So we have to plan on making room. We have to position ourselves and then we've got to be ready for God to be able then to move in power in our life. Verse 17 is when God moved in power in this woman's life. It says the woman became pregnant and the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. God granted the desire of her heart. Now, if you read the rest of her story, it's definitely not all butterflies and rainbows, but God took that one dream. He took that dream 
that she couldn't even bring herself to voice anymore when Elisha said, what can we do for you? She couldn't even bring herself to voice it. That dream, that desire that she'd so carefully packed away down in her heart, that hope that when the man of God mentioned it, she cried out, no, it's too painful, it's too tender. God took that dream and God revived that dream for her. Have you ever hoped for or prayed for or believed for something for so long and it has yet to become a reality in your life and now like you don't even wanna talk about it anymore? Maybe your dreams have been crushed so many times that it, when it comes to that particular thing, like you've built a wall around that thing. You've got a wall around that dream or hope. This woman, potentially, she went up to the same spot on her roof where she spent, I don't know how long, crying out to God. She went up to that same spot and she didn't build a wall around that dream in her life, you guys. She built a room. She physically built a room. I think so many times in our life, in our season of silence, we have the tendency to build a wall around that thing that we're asking God for. And I think tonight he's asking us not to build a wall around it, but to build a room and invite God in. I know, like I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, like I know that God wants to move in power in our lives because the Bible tells us, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desire of our hearts. I know, I know he wants your marriage restored. I know he wants you not just married and surviving, but I know he wants you madly in love with your husband. I know he wants you free of that eating disorder. I know that he wants you healthy and he wants you whole. I know he wants you free from the, the chains of debt in your life. Students in here, I know he wants you to have a healthy relationship with your friends. I know he wants you to have a healthy relationship with your parents. He wants us released from the bondage of lust of sexual sin in our life, of pornography. He wants to see that dream that you have of writing that book or recording that song or opening that business or quitting that job. Fill in, the, fill in your own blank in that sentence. He wants to give you the desire of your heart. A few weeks ago when I was preparing for this message, I was getting ready one morning and I was in my bathroom and this was in the month of February, so this is when I was reading through the Bible in the month. And like I said, like I wasn't digging down into verses. I was just, you know, letting it flow. So I'm curling my hair, and I've got my U version like propped up against my mirror so I can read along as the man is reading to me. And so I'm doing my hair, and I'm reading, and I'm in Acts. So it was close to the end of the month. I was in Acts chapter 12, and I'm reading this random story in Acts. And I'm going to read you a couple of verses of it. This was about Peter, and he had just been released from prison. And I want you to listen to these verses. It says, when Peter went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it, and she exclaimed, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. He was supposed to be in prison. But when she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. So right now, I can probably bet that most of you are like, what the heck, what does that have to do with our story tonight? Well, when I was reading that story, God would not let me get past one of those verses. He wouldn't let me get past verse 13. Verse 13 says this, Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. A servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. Like her name was Rhoda. 
Rhoda. I was like, God, why in the world is some random servant girl who flaked out on Peter and didn't answer the door, why does her name get recorded in scripture for all of history? Like, why is her name down and our woman in the doorway goes unnamed? And I will never, ever, ever forget this moment when I am staring at myself in the mirror and I heard God tell me, he shouted this into my soul. He said, Kristen, I left the woman in the doorway unnamed so that you could put yourself into her story. So that it wouldn't be like, well, yeah, but that was Mary's miracle or that was Rebecca's miracle or Deborah's Mary miracle. I left her unnamed so that you could claim that miracle in your life. I think so many times women, I think we get so hung up on thinking that's what God did for her. That's her miracle. He brought her that man. He gave her that baby. She got, he got her that job, whatever it is. We get so hung up and thinking that's the miracle that God did for her and not me. And so I think that, that God in all his wisdom for me in 2021 left this woman unnamed in scripture so that it was easier for me to put myself in her story so that you could put yourself inside of her story, so that you could climb under your bed and you could bring out this box with this hope or this dream or this desire in your life so that you could climb under there. I don't know when you put it under your bed. Maybe it was last week. Maybe it was last month or last decade. But you could climb under there you could bring it out and you could stand back in the doorway and you could just position yourself in order for God to move in power in your life. So what's your doorway? What doorway do you need to get back in tonight? And remember, our, our Shunammite woman she didn't just accidentally find herself in this doorway. She came up with a plan to make room in her life for God. She literally built it. She positioned herself close to the man of God so that she could hear his voice. Some of us can't hear from God because we haven't cleared any space for him recently. And you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge all of us tonight in this room to, to not get so caught up or ashamed of that fact that we haven't been able to make room for God in our life. Don't get so caught up tonight trying to act like and look like you've got it all together so much so that you don't do some real work tonight. Because if I had to guess, I would say that all of us in this room need to clear out some space to be able to hear the voice of God. And you know what, while we're at it, we might need to kick out some other voices that are taking up the place of God. Because the space that we clear is gonna determine what we hear tonight. And you know what, our, our, our Shunammite woman, I just wanna remind you that, that while she had no thought of reward when she made room, for God, like Elisha asked her, what can we do for you? She said, no, I'm good. Though she had no thought of reward, when she made room for God, God still gave her the desire of her heart. He gave her a son. But I just wanna make sure tonight that we understand this, that if God never gave me another blessing, that making space for him in his presence would always be enough. Because if I have his presence in my life, I can walk through anything. His presence doesn't always equal gifts. But listen to this, his gifts always accompany his presence. His gifts always accompany his presence. And those gifts 
those blessings in our life, those are a result of our obedience, our obedience to make room for Him, to position ourselves to move, position ourselves to be in God's presence and to let Him move in power, give Him that chance to move in power in our lives. I'm gonna come back up here in just a few moments, but before I do that, I wanna give us all just a chance tonight to just have an honest conversation with God. So would you guys all stand up to your feet? We might not know the name of the woman in our story, but I wanna remind you that God knows your name. He knows everything about you. He is your creator. He knows everything you've been through. He knows everything you're going through right now. He knows what's in that box. He knows that hope and dream and desire that, you've, that you have pushed away down in your heart, that you have shoved underneath your bed. And listen, he wants to talk to you about that tonight. He desperately wants to talk to you. If we would just make room in our lives and let him do whatever it is that he wants to do. So let's join together tonight as women seeking after the presence of God in this room. Would you pray? Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Jesus, just tonight as we sing and as we cry out to you, as we make room in our lives, as we position you, as we put, get in position for you to move in power in our lives, we're just asking that you breathe life back into us tonight as we surrender to you.